Hello. Welcome to another week of Extra Credits. Thanks to you guys, our inbox has been filling up pretty rapidly with questions and future topic suggestions. In fact, we've gotten so many questions that we've decided to devote an occasional episode to answering several at a time. This will give us a chance to address the most popular questions and discuss topics that we don't need an entire episode to cover. So, let's get this first mailbag episode underway. Hey James, you got the bag? Sweet. Okay. When is this flood of samey first-person shooter games going to stop? They're all so generic and bland. This is probably the number one most asked question in our inbox, so let's give it a proper answer. The obvious reason we're seeing so many of these games every year is because of how popular the genre has become. Games like Halo and Modern Warfare are breaking sales records all over the place, and even lame first-person shooters are selling a decent amount these days. If a game studio is looking for a low-risk project, it's pretty much a no-brainer right now. Besides which, there are some incredibly advanced tools out there for making these games. The Unreal Engine is an amazing tool for building first-person shooters, and it's practically ready to use right out of the box. No other genre has a publicly available tool like that, at least not yet. This has made first-person shooters the easiest kind of game to get to at least double-A status, so you can imagine why the market feels so flooded lately. But I think it's helpful to maintain some perspective here. I know it seems like the FPS genre is nothing but a stagnating pile of Halo and Modern Warfare knockoffs right now, but that largely depends on how you define first-person shooters. If you define the genre as games like Call of Duty and Halo, then yes, of course the genre by definition feels samey and slow to evolve. But if you include all games based around first-person shooting, the selection suddenly looks a lot more diverse. Bioshock, Fallout 3, Team Fortress 2, Fallen Earth, Portal, Stalker, Metro 2033, Savage 2. Now that's a much more interesting variety. Don't worry though, eventually some new genre will take off and we'll have a new flood of games to get suck of. Alright, one down. Next! How do I get a job in the game industry? Another popular request. We're probably going to try to do an episode on this eventually, but it's a really hard topic to condense into six minutes. We're working on it. Until then, I'll just throw out some quick tips. 1. Know the specific kind of job you want to do. 2. Find a school with a good reputation for teaching that job. DigiPen and USC are good places to start looking. 3. Network. Seriously. This is one of those industries where knowing people makes all the difference. Make business cards, email people, go to GDC and strike up conversations, keep in touch with classmates. Seriously, this industry is smaller than it looks, and getting your foot in the door will be far easier if you have friends on the inside. 4. Get an internship as soon as possible. The summer of your sophomore year is not too early. 5. Don't apply for a job you don't want just for the hope of breaking into the industry and changing positions. Yes, sometimes it works, but just spare yourself. Trust me, your life will be better for it. What do you think of my game idea? Several of you have emailed us your own design concepts and game ideas, hoping to get a professional opinion from James. Unfortunately, James is legally obligated to not look at any of them. I know, it sucks, but it's a liability issue. Say he did look at an idea that someone submitted, and then one day a game he worked on included elements that were kinda similar to that person's idea. Even if it was a complete coincidence, that person could potentially sue him or his clients. Just... messy. Sorry we can't be more help there. Next! Where can I get that outro music? I'm glad you asked. The majority of the music I use for the end credits can be downloaded free of charge at Overclocked Remix. If you love games, music, and game music and haven't checked this place out, remedy that immediately. For those few remixes I use that can't be found on OCR, I always put the song title in the closing credits, so a quick Google search should do the trick. Enjoy! What do you guys actually do? Like, what's your actual game industry experience? Fair question. I am an animator at Pixar Canada. Allison is a freelance artist who has done work for numerous game studios, and James, well, as he would put it, he gallivants. He's worked as a game designer in the AAA industry, he's run his own MMO studio, and now he runs a consulting firm. He's worked on everything from Call of Duty to Farmville. He also teaches master-level classes at DigiPen, and in his free time, well, he doesn't have any. Seriously, though, dude's been around. What are your thoughts on 3D gaming? Honestly, we're a bit skeptical. I can think of only one example of 3D in film where the technology really added to the experience, and I have yet to see a 3D game succeed in that regard. If 3D technology is going to take off, it's going to have to prove that it can help the player get lost, get immersed in the experience, rather than distracting from it by making the player aware of the technology. And then there's the cost of entry. Sure, the 3DS won't be too expensive, but that's because it uses parallax barrier technology, which requires the user to be in a very specific location in relation to the device for it to work. That's not a feasible solution for home consoles at this point. How many people are going to be willing to pay for Sony's 3D experience? Even if you already own a PS3, now you need the right kind of TV, and those glasses aren't cheap, or fashionable for that matter. Overall, you're looking at thousands of dollars. Because if the PlayStation 3 has ever been lacking in any way, it's that the hardware wasn't expensive enough. 
what's happening to PC gaming? Is it dead or just dying? Local PC gaming is hurting these days because it's relatively complex and expensive for the player compared to consoles. If you want to do it right, you're going to need a multi-thousand dollar machine. Yeah, I know you can do it for cheaper if you really put in the effort, but it's hard to compete with the cost and convenience of paying a few hundred bucks for a console once every few years. My point is that one really has to invest in being a PC gamer, and the range of people who are willing and have the technical know-how to do so has become relatively narrow, and with game budgets getting so big, that smaller audience isn't quite as appealing a market anymore. But that said, the PC is actually having a pretty good year. Civ V just came out, StarCraft II is finally here, and Diablo III is on the horizon. Empire Total War this year, Shogun Total War next year, a new World of Warcraft expansion by Christmas, and Apple products are finally getting some love too, which I think is a promising sign. The PC may not be on top of the world, but I don't think it's anywhere near dying. And really, this question kind of depends on your definitions as well. If you factor in MMOs, social games, flash games, and the occasional indie hit, PC gaming's actually kicking ass right now. Why has the JRPG genre gotten so stagnant lately? Well, for both the American and the Japanese game industries, games have become very expensive to make, which has led to fewer risks being taken, which has led to stagnation, and the JRPG genre has definitely been affected. But while many people say that the entire genre is in decline, I don't think that's exactly true. I think that there are actually only a handful of JRPG companies we really care about, and two of the biggest ones merged years ago. When I say JRPG, what's the first company that springs to mind? Exactly. I think we tend to use Square Enix as a barometer for the entire JRPG market. So when they have a bad year or turn out a few lackluster titles, we take it as a sign that JRPGs are all going downhill. This is a mistake on our part, for two reasons. A. Square Enix has lost a lot of their best people over time, and B. They only turn out a few games a year. I think the JRPG is going through a period of realignment right now. The traditional Final Fantasy-esque games we're accustomed to haven't kept up with the times so well, and are getting too expensive to make. But there are still incredible JRPGs coming from smaller studios like Nipponichi and Atlas. Exciting quality stuff like Persona 4, Valkyria Chronicles, Demon Souls. All innovative games, and from a genre that's supposedly the most stagnant in the Japanese industry. I think we're going to see a big market shift for JRPGs in the next couple years, and I think games like these are a hint at the variety of places this genre can still go. Has The Escapist given you guys a time limit or something? Nope, they pretty much let us run wild. But we've all got jobs, and lives, arguably, so we try to limit ourselves to a running time that we can manage. The longer we make an episode, the more stress we put on Allison's work week, so James and I try to keep each episode as time efficient as possible. We do have a lot of great stuff we're looking forward to talking about, though. Religion in games, achievements, voice acting, piracy, social games, licensed titles and quality sequels, casual versus core, plus all those diversity-related topics we hinted at last week. And as you keep emailing us your questions, that list continues to grow. We really do appreciate the way you guys have gotten involved. Thanks for watching, and we'll be back with a new topic next week. See ya!